the rows of these points of light blurring and whirling, but maintaining that, that very linear path that each of them seem to travel. And with that, you all hit the frigid water of an unknown source. As you all head towards the surface, it is cold as the air hits you. The lake that you are on is not frozen over, despite it feeling like it should be. But as you look up, you see a boat and the boy that you know is Chris sits on a bench inside of it. Oh my God, there you are. Come on, quick, come on. Hey, Craig, C Chris, how, how, how many times have you done this? He looks to Mitch. Then he looks back at you, Rob. Se seven times, Rob. But this is my first time with a Mitch. What happened the last what? time, Chris? We're here. I'm we sorry. gotta hurry. We don't have we don't have much time. You said this is the first Mitch. Am I dead here? Where am I? Man, you're you're supposed to know that stuff. I don't. This is you my told first me time. You would. Great. We're good. yeah. Shit. Chris steps to the middle of the room, and as if he has rehearsed this, he begins to speak, and he is turning almost in a th slow 360 carousel to make sure that each of you can hear this as he says it. If you all had stayed in Garrett, at least one of you would have fallen. Only one way to give you a chance was to force you to a series of dives. It's not as simple as fixing problems. It's more about learning from them. If you can help, help, but remember what you see. Learn from the mistakes that were made by the adults and take advantage of knowledge not known in your Garrett. They will be chasing you through the worlds if you dive to a garret where you exist, you'll take the spot of your person there. Not their body, you'll still be you, but you'll take over their lives. Things you see in the other garrets are almost always based in fact, despite how they might look. All the garrets are different. Some by a little, some by a lot. Boom, it Why shudders are we again. Why in the bathroom now? That it's time. I'll, uh, I'll like look over my shoulder and yell, stage whisper, crystals. At this moment, all of your ears pop. As one, if anyone were watching, you sink like sandcastles struck by a wave and you just dissolve into the linoleum and the door. George and Shannon, you were the closest to the door and kind of the X of this Mitch letter that was formed. You feel yourselves ripped in opposite directions. Mitch, you feel them ripped away from you as you all begin to spin independently. After a moment, Rob, you are standing in front of a vacant lot. After a moment of disorientation, you realize that 
You recognize the homes to the right and left of the lot. This is your neighborhood, but your home is missing. Among the twisted shrubs and tree stumps, a bag of Ping's fine Chinese cuisine sits waiting for someone. Just at your feet, a bit of the grass springs from one of the last patches of snow. It's still green, not because it's resilient. It is green because it isn't a plant, it's glass. The wind blows cold and the snow swirls. George, your dad will be right out, sweetie. George, you are sitting in a small waiting room with only four chairs. None of the other seats are occupied save yours. For a moment, you think you are in one of the reception buildings of the loop, but then you hear the low sound of music coming from the wall-mounted speakers. It's the Muzak version, version of Careless Whisper. The loop doesn't play music, not ever. Before you can get your bearings, the door opens and your father, Eugene Butts, arrives, his wheelchair being pushed by an orderly at the Sunset Homes Retirement Facility. Hi, Georgie. He's having a good day today, the orderly says with a sad smile. Drool collecting at the corner of his mouth, Eugene Butts stares at the space beyond the floor and whispers, I lost my marbles. Mitch, you find yourself face down in a snow-scattered field. Shannon is standing over you. Roll me move. With a failure, you get a condition. One success. You stand up and move away just as a blade whistles by your throat. Bro, when you turn, Shannon flips the blade underhand in her grasp and says, last time I get to kill a Mitch and then my dad will be safe. Shannon, your world is darkness. Roll me and investigate. Four successes. You realize that you are under some type of blanket and after a few seconds of clawing and rolling, your finger snags the internal ring of your body bag as you roll off the stainless steel gurney and crash to the floor. Around you, you see the bodies of me and Dutch on similar steel tables, neither in a body bag. A newspaper nearby says, Wednesday, April 5th, 1989. And the headline of the Times News reads, three teens killed in a stolen car. The translucent door displays the backwards title of coroner's office in the Garrett PD. And someone is coming. And because of a Michigan, you recognize the voice of Chief Rugen. Jerry, you are still spinning through this field of stars. Ben is screaming out, reach out, Jerry, reach out, as he's trying to hold on to you. And with your four successes, one more than what you needed, you grab hold of Ben. Jerry, you open your eyes and you find yourself laying in a top bunk of a bunk bed, reaching down to Ben as he sits on the bottom bunk, reaching up. Around you, your room in your dad's house sits. A bit of a mess, but neat enough. Posters cover the walls, Gang of Four, Metallica, other rocks or rockers mixed with alternative and pop groups, Talking Heads, Prince, Duran Duran. Fabulous Baker Boys, wakey wakey, eggs and bakey, time for school. Ben's mom comes into the room carrying a basket of laundry that she takes to the double dresser and starts to put away. She looks the age she did before she died. Jerry, your mom said she'd stop by around 10 on Saturday to take you shopping at the mall for a certain someone's 15th birthday, she pantomimes towards Ben. And then we are all having dinner Saturday night. No excuses. Now, I'm sure there's some movie or baseball game is playing, but we'll try to eat early enough so you boys have some free time. Jerry, your dad walks in, but it takes you a moment to recognize him. He's thinner, smiling, 
and his nose is in its normal off-center, having never been broken in 1969. His nose now looks exactly like a larger version of Ben's. He wraps Ben's mom in a bear hug from behind, squeezes her and lifts her off her feet. Quick, boys, get downstairs. I don't know how much longer I can hold this monster. Melanie Baker laughs and tries to whip her husband Carl with a towel from the basket, but her arms are pinned, making it extremely difficult. But she is laughing the entire time. You are rude, sir. Now, boys, don't be like your father. Be gentlemen. Arise, minions, and welcome to Unmade Gaming. We are here from the episode of Atari Twilight Season 3, Roll Out. This is the final season of this uh, amazing, amazing show. Uh, as always, if you like what we do here and you want to support the channel, the best way to do that is Patreon. Link for that down below. While you're down there, click on that Discord link. Join us in the Discord. Be a part of the community. Be a part of the conversation. And as always, in the bottom right-hand corner, you will see the Corruption Bar, or in this case, the Michigan uh, Bar. That bar serves two purposes. One is when that bar fills, Greg gets to the hell he wants to us. It's usually terrible. And two, every single doll that goes into that goes back to these wonderful faces that you see here before you. And now, since we had that amazing recap, I turn things over to Greg to take us back to the 80s that never was. Thank you so very much, my friends. I am so, so happy to be back here on Unmade Gaming to go back into Garrett, Maryland and our story, Atari Twilight. Briefly, Atari Twilight is a story about the 80s played using Free League's Tales from the Loop system. Tales from the Loop calls it setting the 80s that never was because of the fantastical elements added to our history. However, here at Atari Twilight, we call it N80s, one of a limitless number of possibilities. Our kids, our heroes, will be traveling between these different versions and variations of the 80s, learning important facts hidden from their own reality. But between all of these different 80s spread out like rows in a garden, between all of these 80s, some things never change. The music is the same. The movies, books, and TV, pop culture, all the same. Everything that you remember or heard about happened. As for our sandbox, Garrett, Maryland is at the heart of it all. There, our five kids seek to save not just their 80s, but all of the 80s that ever were, including our own. In their way stands a cadre of forces so fantastic that only the greatest decade could house them. Characters from television, movies, and novels walk the streets of Garrett. The Transformers, Gremlins, the characters of King's books, and many more all present. Garrett, Maryland, their hometown, is the nexus. It is where the fate of everything will be decided, for it holds the loop, a great mysterious research facility, a miraculous particle accelerator that powers not only scientific progress, but the imagination. And this vast and terrible loop, well, it will likely be the Armageddon of all existence. In this, the last year of the greatest decade, here in 1989, all will be decided for good or ill. The end of the age, and this tale is upon us, Four years, over 127 songs, ultimately 40 episodes in the making comes down to this. We return to N80s here in Garrett, Garrett in the Highlands of Maryland. When last we saw our intrepid band, they had traveled to a boring version of their hometown where they had never existed. After gaining a little information, the potential date of a uh, clerk named Lisa, stealing a wallet and grabbing some McDonald's, they dove again this time separating upon arrival in a brand new version of their hometown. One stands before a vacant lot where their home should be. One greets an infirm father in a rehabilitation facility. One pulls themselves from a body bag. Two learn they are brothers and the last fights for their life. But that was then, where are we now? The only way to go forward is to go back one, Last time, back to our shared story, our 80s, back one last time for the love and the memories, back one last time to stand with our fantastic heroes, George Butts, Jerry Baker, Shannon Locke, Ben McKenzie, Rob Ott, and Casey Mitch Mitchell. Welcome one and all to the end of an age. Welcome my friends to Atari Twilight Rollout, episode two, Velvet Revolution. My players, 
Each of you landed in this new garret. Each of you have been set and tasked with a situation decidedly different than the one that you just left and the one that you have known most of your lives. I would like you to go to our Spotify playlist, everybody, as the songs of the 80s are as much about this Atari Twilight experience as anything else. So if you could go there and cue up a little Cindy Lauper, I drove all night. Rob, you are standing before a vacant lot, one that you have identified by proximity and the use of surrounding flag points is the spot of your home. Well, at least the home that you remember, but a home that apparently does not exist here. It is a vacant lot filled with debris, rough shrubs, a few patches of grass, a few patches of snow. At your feet, something that looks like gra grass, but breaks and cracks like glass, mirrors back to a time several months ago. But strangely enough, as you look around, you see that in the middle of this vacant lot sits a pristine package. It looks brand new of Ping's fine Chinese cuisine takeout. Just waiting there. But my friend, this is not my story to tell, only to tell you where you are. Rob is yours. What does he do? He's going to case, case the joint. I guess more so just kind of be on the lookout, just kind of confused, looking around when this is okay. And then he's going to check to see if there's a ticket on the order. Cause most of the, you know, the receipts usually stapled on, on the uh, star on top of the styrofoam boxes that they come in. So he's going to go see if there's a receipt and see if there's an address, a name or what's, what's going on you get closer and you see that there is in fact a order kind of stapled to the top to keep it closed like you would do as a, an employee. You notice that it is not written. There's not a handwritten note, but there is something that appears to be typed in a dot matrix printer. It says, I kept the engine warm for you. And once you get to the bag, you look to the opposite side, what would have been the back of your house and yard and fence. And there on the other side, on the street beyond, rests the ping mobile. His eyes My are going to get, oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, no. I was going to tell you, roll me and empathize as you take this in. Yes. Um, that would be four successes. Okay, my friend, here's what I'm going to allow you to do. You only needed one for this. Um, so with these other three, I'm going to allow you to do the following. Let me see. What can you do with this? Um, you may ask me a question about your surroundings, or you may pocket the remaining three extra dice that you have to count as automatic successes on any empathize role for the rest of the session. So you can ask me three questions, two questions, pocket one, any variation thereof. Hmm. Let's see, and this has to this has to pertain to my immediate area and surroundings and available knowledge, right? And your friends, I will okay. allow you to. Who's the closest to me? You don't know how you know this, Rob. You're not sure, you can't see anything. You can't tell, you don't have any type of uh, uh, ESP or telepathy or that you know of, but you feel that you are very close to Mitch. You have no idea in which direction he is, but you feel that you are close to Mitch. So Rob's gonna misinterpret that and feel like he senses a friend in danger. He's gonna say, he's gonna think it's like a spidey sense, you know, because he's sure he's super yeah. superhero mind, right? And um, <clears throat> now you have two other questions yeah. you can ask, or you can bank them and just have um, two successes for empathize. I, I would have two successes for empathize because okay. um, 
Rob's going to now in the takeout. Is it actually food? Is that just a note on the food? Do you open or, it? Yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, you open it up and you realize right away that the box is inside. As soon as you touch the bag, it's too light. It's not filled with food, but the boxes that would contain rice or uh, any of the other entrees inside and kind of folded, but empty. However, resting atop these boxes inside the bag is the mouthpiece to your old mask, your Optimus Prime mask. So just like the, the mouth part? Just the mouth part. He's going to look at it and then look at the ping bill, ping, ping mobile. And um, I'm assuming, is it running since it said the, the card said that it was the engine was warm? Yep. If you go over to it, um, you can see that the key is in the ignition and that the engine itself is warm. The ping mobile having apparently recently been delivered to this location so in he's yeah so then he's just going to get get on it throw the mask on and just go towards where he feels this sense of danger you know his or you know just he needs to get to whatever this feeling is you know and if that be mitch hopefully um then we're going we're going to see mitch i need. i tell you what mitch. You spend one of those empathize successes that you have, and I will make sure that you are riding in the appropriate direction. Yeah. Okay. You yeah. have one left. Mm -hmm. So as you begin to move off and ride the ping mobile that you remember so well, there's the crack in the leather of the seat, you know, everything feels right. The grips of the, the throttle feels right. You know, it has the, the rubberized kind of square handles on it. It, everything feels like the ping mobile that you remembered and had driven all of those deliveries. Um, I would like you though, to roll me, what is it? An investigate as you begin to move off into Garrett. Two success. Ooh, good rolling. Okay, so you may bank one of those for an additional success for an investigate later because you only needed one. Um, as you look around, you notice two things. One, no grav trucks dot the skyline. You don't see any of the large craft lifting and kind of floating over the hills. You don't see any of them kind of moving in and through Garrett as you always have on the skyline of your Garrett where these large kind of block container semis in the air would float along and float over wooded areas and you constantly moving in and out of the city, um, just like we have semis moving in and out of ours. The other thing that you notice, no maintenance robots dot the, the street. You don't see any type of trash collection going on by the, the robots that you saw in your Garrett. This is eerie in a way because the sounds that you're hearing, the grav trucks themselves are quiet when they float and drift along, but you hear almost the background white noise of combustion fueled engines. You hear large trucks, um, things that would only be a rare occurrence and probably part of like farm machinery or something like that, but you hear it almost like it's enveloping this, this section of Garrett as you kind of rev your own combustion engine, which is the ping mobile and blast into this new world. Jerry. Ben looks at you, up at you in the bunk above as your dad, Carl Baker holds Ben's mom in this kind of lock from behind as the, they both laugh and he has indicated that you all should get down to breakfast because school is about ready to start you need to get ready and get to it you can tell that ben can't move his arm it feels like you're holding a broomstick there's no articulation to it he's just staring at his mom what do you do my friend I think Jerry's kind of dumbstruck as well. Um, he, he, despite, you know, being in front of the parents, it may not, might not be a big deal for 
him in front of his dad, but he can't help but just kind of mumble, what the fuck? Neither Melanie Baker nor Carl Baker seem to hear what you have to say, but Ben looks up at you and you can see that there are, Ben has tears welling in his eyes, but he had them before the, the dive as well. And he just looks at you and what does this, what does this mean, Jerry? What's going on? Hey, we'll be down for breakfast in a minute. We got a surprise. We got to get ready. They both stop and Carl looks over and almost as one, they kind of turn and look and say a surprise. Well, and Melanie Baker says, a surprise would you be all being downstairs and ready whenever it's time to go to school? That would be the best surprise for me. But they both smile and give two teenage boys their space as they walk out. Jerry, Jerry, what does this mean? Huh? It just means we jumped. Ben, don't, don't think too much about it, you know? But but they said, um, your dad, not your dad, but like both of our dad. What's that mean? I don't know. I don't know. We need, we need Mitch. We gotta, we gotta get out of here. Did you, did you see how happy my mom was? Yeah. She had nice clothes on. Did you, see, did you see she had nice clothes? Those are those jeans cost like forty dollars. She always wanted those jeans. She always pointed to them when we went to the mall. I tried to get them one time, but I didn't have enough money. Ben, we're gonna get this all figured out. And we're going to get back and then we'll buy your mom those jeans. Okay. But your real mom, mom. My mom's dead, Jerry. Remember? We're going to fix everything. I don't know. I don't know, Ben. Okay. I'm not. We need to get Mitch. If you're as smart as Mitch is. I, Jerry will jump off the top bunk um probably really awkwardly because he's he's kind of spiraling into himself and trying not to let it happen um and uh he's gonna go over to the window and look out to see if there's any way to like exit the room you said it was downstairs for breakfast so i assume we're second story is there is there any way that would be easily traversable outside the window i mean it looks like you i mean you've as jerry you have already narratively described sneaking both into and out of this house That's fair. so yeah so i mean you know of ways to get in and out of the house and it's the same house it's not like it's it's layout has changed at all so you think that you could definitely you know sneak out if you had to and we gotta go I don't, I don't know what's going on here, but we can't get too comfortable. Are you with me? You see that Ben's gotten up and he's standing at the dresser and he's kind of opening the drawers and he says, I, I, I got my own dresser. These are, these are my clothes in here. I just had a box before. Ben, we can't stay. Why not? Because everything falls apart if we don't fix it. Every one of them. Jerry, my stuff's already falling apart. But not here. Did you see how happy my mom was? Yeah, man. Yeah, but we got a job to do. If we don't do it, 
that version of your mom is going to be gone too. I, I I don't want to sneak out then. I I'm I want to at least say you know I want to like see him one more time maybe. Fine, but after breakfast, we gotta go meet the guys. Okay, all right. Maybe maybe they'll be at school too. Jerry, uh, Jerry's Jerry's face is gonna for turn angry towards Ben. Um, maybe he's he's never really done that before, but he's gonna like storm back across the room and grab Ben by the shoulders, just kind of look him in the face, Ben. Yeah, I know this is hard. I know it's been hard. We gotta go. I didn't think it would be like this, though. I didn't. Yeah, it would be easier if everything sucked. I know. Um, I don't know. He reaches to the top of the dresser. The Mitchie Talkies are here. He pulls down your Mitchie Talkies. All of our stuff's here, too. And the stuff that we brought, I guess. Oh, on the back of the Michi Talkies. Like, are, are they legit just the same old Michi Talkies? Do they have our code names on them? They absolutely do. And they're the ones that have just been repaired in the fishing shack, you know, for you all just moments before. Jerry will turn it on and then kind of uh, motion to Ben. Like, We're going to go have breakfast, but just... Wheeljack... This is Ironhide. Over. Put a pin in that. Hmm. And you hear a call from downstairs. It's Melanie Baker. Surprise or not, it's time to go, boys. You see Ben over at your closet, and he opens it up. My dad's jacket's not in here. Um, I guess I'll wear this. And he puts on a jean jacket. It fits. Look, it fits right. It, it looks good. It looks good. Let's, Jer, Jerry's meanwhile, like getting himself ready. Um, Probably subconsciously picking the crappiest clothes in the dresser. The oldest, maybe the most ill-fitting. There's some older clothes in there. You can see that they've probably been set aside as potential like work clothes. Uh, probably earlier they were play clothes, but um, they're not that old. In fact, some of the worst stuff you can pull out of there probably would have been some of Jerry's best stuff elsewhere. Yeah, he's not going to voice that that bothers him. Um, let's just go to breakfast. Let's just go to breakfast and, you know, let them talk. Maybe they'll tell us about this place. I don't know. He's, you see him lacing up a brand new pair of, like, jet black uh, uh, Converse All-Stars, like Chuck Taylor's. But the, the soles are white on these. They're not dirty at all. This is... This is like those stories, man. It's like... It's like... When they, when they go to the underworld, if you eat the food, you gotta stay forever. Don't eat... Don't eat the food, Ben. Roll a charm with a plus two. Because you're talking to Ben. I 
don't remember how to do things. There it is. One success. At that, and now it Ben nods. Okay. And he kind of quickly ties up the other shoe. Okay. Okay. Let's, let's go. And he heads out the room. Gary's going to have like one last look around. Um, take the walkie talkie. Um, probably throw it in a book bag. I'm assuming he has one of those. Um, this is a room that if Jerry were to be able to decorate a room as teenage boys do not decorate, especially ones like Jerry, but they are able to um, mark their territory. And if Jerry had been able to pick the perfect way to do so, this room represents it. A monster rig. Yeah, I think just a walkie-talkie. He really doesn't need much anything. Um, he'll throw it in his bag and carry it with him. Um, and go downstairs for breakfast. As you all get downstairs, you see Ben's kind of finishing hugging his mom. And she's just hugging him like just a full-on embrace. And she goes, well, I don't know where this came from, but I like it. If this is the way that we're going to start all of our mornings now, I like it. And Ben is just holding on to her. And um, she kind of senses that there might be something wrong. And you see her face kind of drop a little bit and she really hugs him. And she says to him, is there anything okay? And you just hear Ben whisper, I like your jeans. And as you come down, Carl Baker is standing there and um, he is opening up the fridge and you see him, there's two brown bags there um, and he kind of like with a wax paper wrap, you see him make like homemade egg McMuffins and kind of put them in and drop them into the brown paper bags as he slides them over to you guys. And when he opens up the refrigerator to put the eggs back in, you notice free of charge, no roll required. No beer exists in the fridge. You've never seen your father's refrigerator without beer. All right, boys, dinner, breakfast is served, but it is time for you to go. Your ride's here, and you hear a beep from the driveway. My friends, if you could all go to your Spotify playlist, I'd like you to go down to track number five and queue up Elvis Costello's Veronica. Ben looks at you like his eyes are wide. They heard the beep. Kind of has it, he takes his brown bag and his mom gives him one last squeeze and he gives a squeeze and she hands him his backpack, a brand new LL Bean backpack. Yeah, all right. Um, that's totally normal, like always, every day. Let's go, brother. Ben doesn't say anything, but he kind of holds his mom's hand as she has it on the strap of his backpack. And he holds on for just a second as his arm kind of trails away and he just walks out. He turns and put his back to you and Carl and Melanie and walks out. As you presumably follow Ben out, there sits a white Volkswagen rabbit. It's just warm enough to have the top down it's actually not warm enough at all. It's still probably high 40s, low 50s, but the top is down. Sitting inside is Veronica Kirkshaw behind the wheel. Her sister Sam sits behind her in the rear driver's side. Get in, sleepyheads, Veronica says to both of you, you and Ben, as you walk out. Ben pulls back and stands beside you. What do we do? What do we do here at the... Mm. Get in. Um, shotgun. You gotta, yep, you got it. And he kind of goes and uh, pulls the front passenger side seat up so he can climb into the back. And 
pulls it down so you have access to the shotgun seat beside Veronica. Jerry will climb in um, very clearly uncomfortable. Um, he's he's going to like act like he's looking for something in his book bag so that he's not forced to face this situation too deeply. Okay, we're ready to go. Then roll me and investigate as you look in your backpack. That's one success. Then you see the kiss coming as you are pulling up just as Veronica goes in to give Jerry a kiss. What do you do, my friend? Probably chokes on his imaginary gum. Um, he'll, he'll, he'll kind of squeak a little and cough and like pull away and like cover his face. I, um, I think I'm getting sick. Um, as you pull away and look into the back, you realize that Ben has just performed a similar maneuver with Sam, who had leaned in to kiss him. And as both Ben and Jerry are kind of leaning on their respective sides of the car, both of the Kirkshaw girls look at the Baker boys and their eyebrows as one lift. Shannon. Everybody go over to your Spotify playlist, if you would, please, and cue up a little Skid Row. This is track number four, 18 in life. Shannon, you are standing inside the coroner's office here at the Garrett Police Department. The bodies, the corpses of two boys that you have known most of your life, most of your life, Dutch and me, are laid out on these steel gurneys. You had just been inside a body bag on a similar gurney, but your dive, your wake up, and your movement caused it to crash to the ground. You hear somebody approaching. Because of a Michigan last time, you recognize the voice as Chief Rugen. As you look around, you realize that unlike Dutch and Neem, you are clothed, you have your leather vest on, you have your turned off Mitchy Talky. You are not in the same state as them, but you are in the same location. And you saw a newspaper that said three teenagers killed in a stolen car. You have beats, seconds, if you will, here in this garret outside of time. Shannon, what do you do? Uh, she grabs the body bag that she just tossed herself out of and goes to the closest, like, closet or filing cat any any kind of cabinet she could fit herself in this body bag in sure okay roll me a stealth as there are several kind of like standing wardrobes around here yeah um and there's also a bank full of refrigerated trays oh yeah all right one success because i want to all of the closets are filled with chemicals and embalming implements and implements that you would use for, um, you know, if, if, if investigation. Yeah. Um, however, you see that two of the refrigerated tables that go into like the mausoleum type of bank. Well, Hey, they're, they're empty. Yep. They sure are. And they won't, one of them won't be because Shannon's going right for it. Um, she'll probably like, put a part of the body bag corner, just like just barely wedging it between because she's afraid of getting locked into the sting thing. Absolutely, yeah. So you can um, absolutely kind of keep it kind of in between the catch yeah. as you close it, which means that it's open a crack, which means that yeah. you can hear. Oh, okay. And as you are sitting there kind of inside this area, you hear the door open, you hear a lock give, and then you hear the door open. Anyone in here? Anyone fucking around in here? You hear the footsteps. Chief Rugen for everybody involved here is a big man. He is, um, at least he was whenever we first met him, large, Police chief of Garrett 
um, drives a Harley. Uh, he's a big man that knows he's big when he's also cruel. So the worst kind. The heavy utility shoes that is the standard fare for the Garrett Police Department. You hit it, hear it on the linoleum and you hear that kind of that strange kind of sucking, peeling sound, almost like, you know, the plastic coming off American cheese that each time it pulls off the ground. You hear it getting closer. Is there anything you would like to do? Do you, do you try to close the door all the way or do you just maintain complete radio silence, so to speak? She's trying to basically hold her breath at this point. She does not want him to find her. Yeah. I would let everybody know that narratively, Meta in last episode said that she was going to leave her Michi Taki off. If her Michi Taki was on right now, <laughs> a voice would say, wheel jack, wheel jack. But it is off. So it Gosh, says Shannon's so smart. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. You hear, you hear the... Someone's fucking around in here. And then you hear him talking, presumably, to Dutch and me. You two dumb sons of bitches. Can't do anything right. And then he moves away and you hear the door start to close. Where's the third one? Hey, you hear him yelling out into the hall. You hear that kind of muffled as his acoustics get switched from the room you were in to a space just adjacent. Hey, where's the one who was in here? Girl. You hear a voice come over. Uh, Chief, she should be in there. Someone took her somewhere. I want to know where. Um, uh, Chief, I, listen, Simmons, find out where there's a third body. I have two dead kids in here. I need a third. Where it'll look bad in the paperwork. You hear the door close. You hear the conversation continue, net, but now it's muffled. You have no sound. You have no, between the door in front of you and the door that was closed, your acoustics are lost. But you do hear enough. You hear the door lock again. Okay. What She's going to slowly friend? open the, the door um, and be as quiet as she can get out, leaving the body bag in there. Um, she will check to see if there's a tag on the body bag. It says Shannon lock. Okay. She grabs it, puts it in her pocket, and then kind of looks around the room. Um, you said there was a newspaper. She's probably going to grab that, roll it, and then put it in her, like, her back pocket area. Um, and at that point, is there only one entry into this room? Um, or is there like a can, window? There are windows, but they're all clouded over. It's like translucent glass. It's enough to allow light in here, but you can see without even getting close that they're sealed. It's, they're not operable windows. They're just for light. Are they operable enough if they were opened through glass shattering that she could fit through? Oh, yeah. You definitely think you could break oh. this stuff. It's not like it's, it doesn't look like it's like ribbed yeah. with chicken wire or anything like okay. that. Um, however, you do notice that just above the door that was locked, there is one of those. And I, uh, Greg's cheese, Swiss cheese brain forgets the name of those windows that crank above yeah. the old. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. And this is an old building. Garrett PD is one of the older buildings in Garrett. And um, this is a big one of those. I mean, it's enough that you could easily fit through. Okay. Um, she's just gonna, it, our, she can see both me and Dutch like clear as day on the slab, right? They, they are literally lying on their backs and okay. they have like a, like a modesty uh, yeah. blanket across them from the waist down, but they are naked from the waist up. And you see that there are several bruisings and you can tell that even in a state of death, that they've been through some shit. 
Is there a coroner's report anywhere in this room? Yeah, there's clipboards everywhere. It seems to be one hanging from each of their respective gurneys. Can she look at though, them? What was that? You do not have one. Uh, your they had yeah, a collapsed gurney. To. Yeah, yours was yeah. not there. Okay. Um, can I just glance at the first page of Dutch's, for example? Yeah, it says that he uh, traumatic brain injury um, as a result of a vehicular accident. Um, and then if you look at knees, knees says that it was a, uh, uh, cervical separation as a result of a, um, vehicular accident. Okay. She's going to real quick grab like a pen or something and like kind of move their upper lip out of the way just to check their teeth. You do so. They are elongated. Okay. That's fun. just a bit. It's fun. Both of them? Mm-hmm. Okay, cool, cool. Um, so she is gonna go uh, try to, I don't know, does she need to move something or is there like shelves or something that she can use to climb up to the top of the that window there on the door? Uh, Shannon is an intelligent person. This place is filled with gurneys and uh, chairs and things. You can mm-hmm. easily get to the level above the door. Okay, um, she's gonna try to open the window and kind of mm-hmm. pop her head on either side of the hall, I guess. Sure. Do you want to roll? I'll allow you to roll a stealth here or an investigate. Investigate, you're checking before you do anything stealth. You're just going to go. I'll let you know that the stealth is easier than the right. investigate. Okay. Um, uh, I'll investigate first. Two successes. You see the coast is clear. Okay. Uh, sneak. Yeah. Mm-hmm. One success. You are able to kind of squeeze through and drop down and you are inside. This is not necessarily a private section of the Garrett Police Department because the Garrett PD is an old building. And back in the day, a lot of this was accessible to the public no matter what. So it's not kind of you, you are kind of like right in that gray area of where there would be like both civilians and police officers. And so you're in a, a hallway that you wouldn't really not be in um, you know, if someone were to catch you. So it's up to you how you would exit from this. You would know it growing up here. You would know enough about the Garrett PD to know how to get in and out and stuff like that. And you notice that you're, the front door is just a turn or two in the hallway away. Uh, what's the... What is in either direction? Like one, one is the front door and the other goes where? The other would go deeper into what would be like the pit for where the uh, police officers would kind of get their daily briefings and things like that. To the right is more of the police's domain and to the left is more of the public domain. Back to the outside, back to like the waiting area where everybody would come to like file a complaint or, you know, register some type of police report. Um, up to you which way you go though. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, shoot. Part, part, she partly wants to go and find out what happened, but she also doesn't want to risk getting caught. So I think she's going to try to um, just go out the public access way. Um, you turn the right corner, you turn the left corner, and you bump directly into an officer that has a name badge, his badge says Simmons. And he looks down at you and says, oh, I'm sorry, young lady, are you, I, I, are you here to pay your respects? We, we can't have any visitors here for the, oh, the, what happened y- with those boys? Oh, okay. Um, do you know when, you know, the families can, can come by and, and do that? Well, the, the families have all been notified and next of kin or they're on site, but I, I, I'd appreciate, I can't believe it's gotten out already who the, the, the kids are, but um, yeah. just uh, keep it quiet until we make sure, because I mean, uh, uh, grandparents and whatnot, we're really scared that some of the grandparents are going to find out before they're notified. And we don't want any type of shock, you know, more so than would it already be. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty terrible, actually. Um, okay, well, then I are, will. Are you Okay. 
not really, but that's kind of, you know, who would be, right? If you need anything, and he reaches into his pocket, and he pulls out like a billfold that's just full of business cards, and he pulls one out, and it's his police information, you know, badge number, uh, Ted Simmons, hands it to you. You can give me a call anytime. Um, it's tough, you know, when you lose somebody like that. A lot of the guys here, we we were we were over in Vietnam, and we know what it's like. Yeah, and this is very similar. Yeah, it's yeah, not great. I, I appreciate that, Simmons. Um, I'll I'll just yeah I'll go and I won't I won't say anything. Okay. Thanks. She kind of just casually tries to not be suspicious, but she probably is being awkward. Um, just as you're walking out, just as you cross the threshold, that's like the Garrett PD right into the lobby, the, the sergeant's behind the desk. You hear a yell from deep inside the police department. Simmons, where is she? And the door closes behind you. Everybody. Let's see. Turn off the 18 in life, everyone. Let's go with a little silence for just a bit as we jump over to our good friend, George. Uh, George, you have just been gifted with the sight of your father, Eugene, as he has come out of what is a, you would know as a retirement home, but is also a rehabilitation facility. He's in a wheelchair. He is not in a good way. And he has drool collecting in his mouth. And he whispered almost like he was looking through the floor. I lost my marbles. But I'd like you to roll and empathize as this scene hits you. A failure will result in a condition. Well, what do you know? Mm. That is a failure. My friend, you are given the condition upset. As soon as you feel this way and you feel this rush of emotion, the last time you saw this man, he was fighting himself and he was fighting enemies as he allowed your, you and your group to escape. So the idea that Eugene is now, the man that you, again, everybody face claim Eugene Levy here. Um, <sighs> Eugene Butts is, was a great guy. He was a dad joke kind of dude. Um, and then he wasn't, and then he was evil. And then he fought against that and had been fighting against that and kind of came back to his son at the end of last season. But as you're looking at this and you see this, this broken man in front of you, his, he's kind of twisted on one side, one shoulder above the other. Um, one side of his face seems uh, paralyzed or loose as if he has suffered from a stroke. Um, the drool is collecting from that side. And you see that his eyes are almost milky as they stare at the floor. You feel and get that condition upset. And just as you feel these emotions surge into you, George, in your field of vision, in what would be your lower right-hand corner, you see a blinking box. Uh, I think I'll just pat him gently and say, you know, I got, I've been practicing my marble status. It's, it's, I'll, I'll give you any I can spare. And I pat him gently and, uh, and go over to that blinking box. And again, as you kind of turn to go to the blinking box, you realize it's not something outside of your vision. It's in your eye. And it looks like a cursor just... I'll try to concentrate on it and see if I can move it without moving my eyes. If that makes sense. Kind of like how you don't tell your arm to move. Mm -hmm. It just does. As you focus on that blinking box in your field of vision, it begins to elongate and it turns and almost turns to like a razor thin edge. And then it flips up and it says with a question mark at the end, Suppress emotional response. 
That's interesting. Um, you have to blink yes. for a second as a tear rolls down as you continue to see your father in this way. And with the condition upset, it's. Yeah. Yeah. He's going to try to put on a brave face. So yeah, if there's like a prompt he can say yes to, then we'll say yes, suppress. It again turns onto a razor's edge and kind of zips off to the right. Remove the condition upset. You feel nothing. Marbles. That is both cool and upsetting. <laughs> Sorry, keep going. Yeah, you hear Eugene whispering, Marbles, Georgie, Georgie. I'm here, Dad. Georgie. Look to see what they're doing. They're doing something. Who? Them the loop. What do you think they're doing? They got him fooled. Fooled into what, though? I know what you mean, but like you have to tell me. They did something to my head. Don't worry, Dad. I'm gonna. We're gonna fix this. Hmm. Mom didn't die in a car accident. What do you mean? They did it. I'll get to the bottom of it. I lost my marbles. I just pat him. I don't know what else to say. So I just pat him. About 30 seconds after your father finish, finishes speaking, the door bursts open and you see the orderly and a man in a suit. The orderly looks at you and gone is that pleasant demeanor. That gone is that he's having a good day and it's replaced by a business expression. He's been off his meds for a bit. We need to make sure he gets medication. He's going to be in pain if we don't. And the man in the suit doesn't move into the room, but stands in the back and both of his hands are behind his back. Uh, I'll get between the orderly and my father. <clears throat> Said, I'm not, I'm not done. You know, you can come back later. He's going to start having pain and we have to manage it. It's part of our oath. Mm. Well, I'm going to make an oath right now that you'll be feeling some pain if you don't leave right now. The man pulls out a gun. I want to pull and, out a gun. <laughs> and levels it at George. Son, I think you believe you have a choice here. I would like to let you know you do not. You know the agreement. Your father's alive. He's in here. You get to live in that nice little house of yours. Don't act up. Hmm. I don't say anything. <clears throat> I just like tuck in my jacket and... Uh... Uh, angstily walk out if there's a cot if there's a glass jar of cotton balls on the counter they're on the floor shattered as i walk oh there the can, absolutely can be and you can absolutely shatter them. yeah I as you out. shatter them and walk out the last thing you kind of hear is that man going fucking teenagers you walk outside as they grab eugene butts and wheel him off to the back where he will have an accident. 
speaking of accidents. Everybody, could you go to your Spotify playlist? Please go down to track number three, Take On Me by AHA. And I'd like to let everybody know that if you are a GM, you've never lived until you've choreographed or plot pointed a combat scenario to AHA's Take On Me. Mitch, you are yes. in what is called extended trouble. You need four successes. If you do not have four successes, you will take a condition regardless of what you intend to do after each round. The person in front of you is Shannon Locke. This is not Shannon Locke of the leather vest. This is not Shannon Locke who just snuck out of the Garrett Police Department. This is Shannon Locke wearing a suit dressed more like Peter Gabriel or Robert Palmer, a little high on the ankle, her hair tied back in a ponytail. But all of those other accessories and all of those other dress are secondary in nature to the six inch blade she is holding in a reverse grip in her right hand in a grip that speaks volumes about how she can use it. My friend, she lunges for you. I need you to roll move for me. Cool. Uh, let's see here. One success. With one success, she draws a four inch gash along your ribs, cutting through your jean jacket, excuse me, your jean vest. Cutting through, you feel it skip off one of your ribs. You don't know how that you can identify the particular feeling, but it's something you'll never forget. And you immediately identify it as that went off my rib. You have the condition injured as she opens you up on the side. She spins it back around to the uphand grip and says, Go ahead, Mitch, run. You always run. What do you do, my friend? On the injured thing. Okay. Um, cool. I'm going to refresh my roll 20. Uh, that's what I'm going to do. Um, what do I do? So we're in, correct me if I'm wrong, but we're in trade winds, right? You are in a field. And oh. now that you've stood up, you look around and you realize you're just on the outskirts of Garrett. In fact, you are beside what looks to be a construction site, but you're in the agricultural field just beside it. Okay. Okay. Um, in fact, this is a type of field that I don't know if you were running from a robot with machine guns, you'd probably run into this field, but that's mm, not here nor there. Mm, you just have Shannon with a blade in front what of What a specific reference, Greg. Um, I am injured. Okay. Oh, why can I, I can't click on any conditions. I don't know what's happening here. Um, okay, cool. Uh, we'll figure that out. Um, what do I do? I need to, do, Greg, do, you said the, the look wasn't important, but does she look like the, the, the suited people that were chasing me in the middle school in season one? Or does she just look like regular Shannon in a weird suit? She looks like if, uh, Shannon Locke had been cast as an extra in Children of the Corn. Got it. Cool. Um, I would love to, uh, kneecap her. Um, so like I'm running, I, I want to run like at her. Like I want to run through, uh, through Shannon Locke here, um, in the direction of town. Uh, and when I do, I'm going to pipe wrench to the knee is what I'd like to do. Okay. Uh, then roll me a force with your iconic item bonus because of how you're using this as a weapon in this particular instance. Cool. Um, I will let you know failure results in a condition. I don't know why I can't check off any of my conditions. Um, okay, so I'll just add, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll add one less to my, uh, my bonus. Uh, right. Force. Um, well, hold on. So plus a D6. Uh, bonus slash R D6. Just in case. No. Okay. So one success as I crank her in the knee. <clears throat> you hit her in the knee and she deftly kind of jumps out of the way. A little shocked that you charged instead of rabbiting like she expected you to. And as she comes in, she pays for it by taking a bit of a hit, but it's not a solid hit. And she is able to spin and drops her elbow onto the back of your head, causing you to be dazed as you 
pop forward, you're going to take a second condition here. This one is going to be, we're just going to say it's upset um, in lieu of, you know, stunned. Uh, and she spins and looks at you as she kind of readies her attack. Are you continuing to run as you uh, kind of barrel through her attack and then head towards Garrett? Yes. Yeah. Like it was hit her in the hit her as hard as I can and continue running towards Garrett. Okay. You're stunned. You see Garrett kind of triple and double in front of your vision as the grav truck less skyline kind of moves back and forth in your brain ever working and ever moving says there are no grav trucks. Where are the robots? It's one of those, you know, you're always connecting the yarn on your board, um, even in this particular situation, but your side is immediately damp. You can feel it sticking and pulling already. It feels like you pulled your side, like you have muscle pulls there. Um, and as you're running, you start stumbling through the area, drops of your blood kind of lying on the, the intermittent snow that is here. I'd like you to roll me either, actually roll me both. Roll me a move and roll me an investigate as you are trying to escape from Shannon Locke. Cool. Uh, as he's running, he is going to grab one of the, the walkie-talkies that he fixed, um, and he's just yelling into this thing, Michigan! Michigan! Um, you said uh, and move? Sorry. Right. Just as you grab your walkie-talkie, at the same time that you would have yelled Michigan, it bursts to life with, Wheeljack! Wheeljack, it's Ironhide, as Jerry from across the way kind of sputters and... Okay, so with your move failure, mm -hmm. you feel your legs go out from under you as Shannon sweeps them and you drop to the ground and slide, kind of pinwheeling through the loose earth and snow as you come to a stop, immediately pressing to get back up. But with the one investigate, you see the approach of Rob Ott as he is charging like a knight of old on the wingmobile. Rob, you have just witnessed this strangely clad Shannon knife and then hit your friend in the back of the head with an elbow and you see her coming down on him to drive this knife through his back. But my friend, the wingmobile is faster still. What do you do? Rob is going to become speed and <clears throat> he with face mask fully attached um, he's gonna ram her it, you know she, as long as she if she's if, if he can hit her hit her without running over Mitch uh, he gonna do it roll me a move and give yourself a plus two because the wingmobile, as established before, is an iconic item. Move plus two. Oh, okay. Um, you may use your luck. You may push and get a condition, or you can use your um, pride for a, a straight success. Um. We're going to use luck. We're going to go ahead and use luck here. Um, okay. So just going to do that again. Yeah. And no. You may push or you may, you may use your pride for an immediate success. Uh, so I'm going to use my pride. <clears throat> uh, my pride is that Optimus Prime is my adopted father. And I truly believe that I am the one chosen to save them all. <laughs> as ridiculous as it sounds, that's, it's, he, the, that's what he was chosen for. That's, you know, that's how he has made sense of his life. So that's in all true fashion. He believes he's going to wheelie this thing into her face and save his best friend, Mitch. Everybody, because I am prepared for just such a circumstance, please go to your Spotify playlist. Go down to the very bottom where you will find track number 11, which is Dare by Stan Bush. Uh, turn that one on. Everybody, this is from Transformers the movie. Um, and with a one shall stand, one shall fall. You charge in, pop a wheelie on the wingmobile as the front tire takes Shannon squarely 
in the chin and you see her rock it back like she had just been punched by Apollo Creed and she launches through the air and you see her actually dip down into a ravine some 10 feet away as you <clears throat> pull back down right beside Mitch. My friends, you are together. Rob is prime. What do you do? <clears throat> um, sorry. Not. There's no response. Mitch. It was rhetorical. Uh, Mitch, like, is holding his ribs uh, and stumbling uh, towards the pingmobile. We, we gotta go. Real bad. Real bad, Shannon. We gotta go. And he, like, is climbing onto the bike. And there's, like, it's not it's not pretty. There's, like, one arm, like, holding on over the shoulder uh, as for support uh, as he is, like, trying to hold his insides inside. Um... And then with all the adrenaline flowing, Rob's going to drop the clutch and kind of you know, wheelie up again and, and take off, showing that he, in fact, just missed time to gear shift and didn't actually mean to wheelie into her, but that's what happened. Love that. And <clears throat> it's, it's all in the reflexes, right? Mm -hmm. As you are able to collect Mitch, and again, without need for a roll here, uh, Frags, uh, Rob can tell that Mitch is really hurt this isn't you know hey i fell down or i got my bell rung or something like that like you see that the side of his vest is a huge dark circle you see that there is a slash through that vest that is several inches long and sarge, mitch is already pale sarge is a friend right so i mean i mean canonically he's 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 been a he's been a pal um Rob's going to take his chances and try to go bring him to Sarge. He's not going to take him to a hospital. It's too, too, too public. And okay. uh, if Sarge was in the military, he probably knows first aid at least. Well, that is fantastic because everybody, if you would turn to your map, you will see that the Sarge's house is directly across the street from, and as the ping mobile moments later, rolls through Garrett with Mitch grasped on the back and uh, Rob behind the, the, the wheel, so to speak. The door to the Garrett PD opens and Shannon Locke stumbles out into the sunshine. Not doesn't stumble. Strikes a pose out into the sunshine. You both see her. What do you do? Uh, Mitch oh. tries not to die. Uh, <laughs> he fails. Roll a new character. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, I think he's he he has he is too he's hiding he's holding on to um, Rob too tightly and his ribs too tightly to do anything other than breathe uh, heavily into Rob. Um, Rob's gonna kind of just watch her and and see what she does. Is she gonna attack us? Is she gonna? Okay. Paralyzed with fear, but more paralyzed with caution, just to kind of see where this goes. Does Shannon see them? Yep. You see, I mean, it, you hear the ping mobile more than anything else as you walk out and you see the ping mobile with two occupants on it. Um, Rob at his customary position behind the, the sticks. And um, what do you do as these, they approach and they're eyeing you strangely. Uh, can I tell that Mitch is hurt? Uh, I'm going to go ahead and say from this distance, he de definitely smells like he's hurt. I hate that. <laughs> okay. Uh, <clears throat> I, I guess you kind of like fast walk to, to the sidewalk where the, the ping mobile would be starting to like come by. You all see her quickly approaching on an intercept course with the ping mobile. So just stop, 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 stop. Okay. What? Boop, boop, Hi. Boop. Are you you? Are you? I'm I'm me. I don't know if you're you because I I I I just ran, ran you over. Wait. What? Me? No, no, no. You. I was just in the morgue. I was not run over. Well, you, actually, I don't know if I was run over. I'm bleeding a lot. Bleeding. Oh yeah. Stabbed yeah. him. I 
I did not bad actually. Chance. There's a bad chance. Okay, we can argue about this later, bad but chance. I don't think there's room for three yeah. of us on this. So where are you going? Because He's getting heavy. He he heavier. I'm not taking him to the hospital. I got to just okay. Just hold, hold, well, hold, we're in front of a police fight. station right now, so probably yeah, right yeah. here is not a great place to bleed yeah. out. I'm just gonna band aid. Just, just we're, I'll, we're, I'll we're, run. You go that way, yeah, and I will. Duct tape it. Look, look, looking for Sarge. Duct tape, duct tape it in. Okay, I'll, 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 I'll uh, I don't, I don't know if he's even here. Okay. In this, you know. It's fine. Can, can you just like get him to the to the side of the road, and then no, I will try to help or something. That's a bad shit. Uh, Rob's going to take three steps to the bad right to make sure that he's at the side of the road and yeah, not knife. directly in the road. Did he stop, like, get off the, the yes. pink mobile? Yeah. <laughs> like, he's, he's being very okay. literal right now. Oh, okay. So Shannon is going to look, I mean, like, is he, like, bleeding, bleeding out? Yeah. I'm yeah. pretty sure the he's... right side of me is also Sue. red. Sue, Shannon. Um, That's bad. Sh what Shannon would have... Uh, as we've stated narratively, Shannon's dad, Sean, uh, a right. military man, has trained her quite extensively right. in a lot of different things. Um, first aid definitely being one of them. And yeah. when you would look at this, Shannon, this is one of the worst injuries you've seen. Okay. It's also, uh, uh, as soon as you look at it, um, you remember your dad referring to specifically like cuts and um, kind of like blunt force trauma. There's two different ways that a cut can be. It can be a tear or it can be a surgical cut. This is a surgical cut. It's very thin, mm. almost like it's practiced by a trained hand. Yikes. Okay. So it's pretty deep then. Um, okay. Well, uh, do you have, does he have a jacket stitches. on? Does he, um, sorry, it's does... A, it's a vest. No. no. <laughs> like, with, like, arms. Like, long Mitch long doesn't arms. have sleeves on anything he owns. Yeah. Does anybody have sleeves? Because neither does Shannon. Does yes. Rob have sleeves? The Rob has cool sleeves. <laughs> yeah, Rob, I need, <clears throat> I, need that I need that shirt right there. Yeah, just, you're not you going to need it. Do you rip my sleeves yeah, basi off? Yeah, basically, yeah. Rob has never felt more manly than he does right now in a sleeveless shirt. <laughs> Shannon ties both of the sleeves together to like get a little bit more leverage to pull around Mitch's area, like his, his side. And as tightly as she can, she like knots it as tight as she can around the wound. Uh, okay. Okay. You do so. Um, just at that time, a white Volkswagen rabbit rolls around the corner and Barry, uh, Jen, Jen and Barry, yeah, uh, Jerry and Ben, um, C, <laughs> right, right, I knew I was going to do that. It took me three seasons to hit that. Um, you, both of you look outside of the, you know, with the top down in this frigid weather, especially with the wind blowing, um, both you and the Kirkshaw sisters notice that you see the Kirkshaw sisters don't recognize the people on the road, um, you two, however, do. Jerry, Jerry, oh, we got we got to stop. Um, Jerry, to make her stop. Hey, hey Veronica, uh, stop. <laughs> she slows down. Does not stop. Why? There's the guys. What guys? Who are they? One of them's bleeding, Jerry. I know. Well, when did you get your medical license, Jerry? Last night while I was sleeping. Just stopped the car. She does so. She kind of rips the emergency brake up in the, the center uh, console. And she turns and folds her arms. We're stopped. <clears throat> it, ben, Jerry will get out of the car. Um, pull up the seat. Ben, get out. Yeah, okay. yeah, we are going to help um, uh, these um, strangers. Uh, mm -hmm. And he gets out. Go, go without us. We'll meet you at school, I think. School? What do you mean you think the fuck, Jerry? Look, 
I can't explain. You have to trust me. Roll me a charm plus four. Oh. All right. Well, I'll give it that and then roll two more. So one success. With that success, she releases the parking brake. And before you've stepped fully out, the, the Volkswagen's already moving and the door kind of closes on its own. And she says in the nicest way possible, fuck you, Jerry, and drives off. And Sam's in the back, like watching, and she kind of turns and kind of craw crawls up into the front seat with her sister as you all are be there departing towards Braddock High. Isabel, Shannon. What? I'm it's not a, a bad Shannon. No, I'm it's not. A, shut up. It's a bad Shannon. She has a suit oh, and a knife. She got a knife suit. Bad Shannon. It kills bitches. Maybe he's lost a lot of blood. She Come stabbed on. me in the ribs. She no, kicked no, me in the no. ankles. I, I de de definitely hit her with the penguin bill. Okay, and where is she now? Is she following you? In a field. Probably. In a field. Mm. In a field. Okay. Okay, let's uh, take care of the fact that Mitch is bleeding out. So um, much, uh, that that is not so going to hold. That's a temporary. Also, so hi much, Ben. So, so hi much, Jerry. So much I'm supposedly. Never mind. That's actually a conversation for later. Um, what did you guys do? You know this is the last Mitch, right? <laughs> I don't know. I just walked out here and blood. Um, she says she got to okay. kill more. He needs yeah. stitches. So yeah. either we take them to the hospital or we find something that I can do stitches, although uh, I haven't done stitches on something that, that big, but. Shut up. She and then said, and Miss up, Maggie knows how to sew. Shut up for a second. She said, M she, said she, Maggie, could, she, she said she got to kill me to save her dad. She's not gonna stop. We gotta, she kill more. Okay, okay, hold on. Let's maybe make sure you don't die first. Thank you. And then we'll talk about why she's killing you. Okay. Guys, <clears> it hurts a lot. It's not what I expected. It's way worse than movies. Um, it's at this time, walking from what would have been the hospital a block above, down this direction, George, you round the corner, and as luck and the mechanics of Tales from the Loop would have it, you see your friends surrounding a fallen form of a Mitch. Oh, I double time it. Assuming that Mitch is down, like dead, I, I mm -hmm. sprint as fast as robotically possible. That blinking cursor appears again. I have too many mute buttons. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I I activate it. See what it says. It says re-engage emotional response with a question mark. Oh. Um, yes. You select it, it turns into that razor line and disappears off to the right. You feel alive. And you double time it up to them super fucking fast. Yeah. Um, when all this is going on mitch is saying i'm the last mitch and they're gonna kill hurt me to help ben saddles up beside jerry and says why do you think they tried to why do you, why do you think they they tried to kiss us that's what girls do when they like you. yeah man but i'm i that would have been my first kiss i'm saving i'm saving uh that I don't even know if I want to get into this with you right now, but like, for who? She goes to another school, you, you wouldn't know her. Yeah, in Canada, right? N no. L L don't worry about, girls, girls are easy. We just jumped into a different dimension, man. 
this one was going really, really, it was going really well until, you know, Mitch looks like he got cut real bad. Yeah. So let's focus on that. And I don't, I don't know, man. You got to stop looking at me like I got answers. I got nothing. I mean, you're my brother, right? <laughs> and he turns and Ben says to the group, uh, 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 Rob's right, um, Miss Maggie or, or the Sarge, whenever I used to, and you realize he stops before he says, whenever I used to have to have injuries tended to, I, I know the Sarge can do first aid. Miss Maggie can too. Okay. Have I rolled up at this point yet? I just wouldn't, was it certain? Oh, yeah. You, you just, okay. you know, sweet. Okay. Not, not out of breath, not sweating. Hell yeah. I don't really care where we go. We're never closer. I just got to stop the blood coming out. Yeah. Well, we kind of slowed it down, but I agree. You need stitches. Yeah. Usually okay. I like to talk and argue, but can we just. Isn't Sarge's house right here? And I just pick him up. Oh. You see Sarge's house, and there is a tall flagpole with a blowing American flag catching the Garrett breeze. All right, let's go, gang. And is I just start yeah. struggling along over there. <clears throat> that's, that's, the, the, that's the real George Bush, right? Are you, are you cradling? Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I'm, like, I'm like holding him. Like I'm going to take him across the threshold. She got me in the red yeah. and... butts, but she got me in the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can smell that. That's a lie. She's, she's so fast. <laughs> I assume we've been at Sarge's house for like a few seconds and he's just still talking about it. Like, oh, I yeah, yeah. It, yeah, you're, you take it over there and you're able to get up like the, the short, you know, it's kind of like a bungalow style house, like a, like a, a 40s, 50s era kind of bungalow house. You're able to go up onto the big front porch and you're at the door. You can knock whenever you would like. Um, without the need for an investigate role, however, I will say that you do hear conversation coming from inside quite a bit of conversation coming from inside. And it is at that point that you see a sandwich board on this great big porch that says town meeting. We can't take a dead kid to a town meeting. I'm still and alive. yet. I'm alive. Okay. For now. This is not good. Okay. Can somebody I don't know, get like a needle and thread. I can do my best. Can I look in the window and see who's there? Oh, you sure can. Yeah, absolutely. Go right ahead. No need for investigate. Um, as you look, it says there's a, um, a lot of people sitting down. Um, there's a big room. Sarge just has a, a big living room. Um, it's the majority of this kind of the house. There's about 10 people sitting inside. You recognize people from the Garrett Fire Department. You recognize people from the hospital. Uh, a couple of suited people that apparently are probably from the loop, you would suspect. Um, but there is a riser in here, and there's actually a sign that says, um, Welcome, Mayor Mandy Sims. And you see Mayor Mandy Sims, and that is Mitch's mom. Oh no. <laughs> um, <clears throat> he's not going to say anything about that. Would he know who Mitch is? Would he? I, he wouldn't. Yeah, no, he would definitely choose the life. You would know her, though, to be very, very polite. You would know her as somebody that has a bit of a substance problem. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's all coming back now. Yeah, he's going to keep that to himself. She's um, starting to talk. You could listen in if you'd like, but I need you to roll and investigate for me, Frags. The, yeah, with time permitting, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll kind of listen in while they're discussing where to get fishing line to fix it. There's always time for this. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I got to roll for it, don't I? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Uh, what, what was it again? I'm sorry. Investigate, my friend. Investigate, okay. Yeah. Um, you can push. I'm going to push it. Your... 
I'm this will take give you a condition if you fail. I know what it'll give me, Greg. <laughs> oh, <laughs> one success. <clears throat> okay, so you do get the condition exhausted, um, but this is just more of just that adrenaline that you had from punting evil Shannon with the ping mobile. That's left you, and you're just feeling it's almost like you're you're coming off that high and you just kind of feel a bit run down. Yeah, adrenaline dump. Yeah, exactly. And uh, you hear Mayor Mandy Sims saying that um, everyone, everyone calm down, calm down. I have been in, my office has been in discussion with the loop from the very beginning. They are building throughout the city and the surrounding areas and the surrounding farms. They are expanding their invention with the loop. Um, and should war with the Soviets occur, they have promised me that Garrett itself will be safe from anything that could happen from a nuclear catastrophe. In fact, President Bush has moved his bunker to Garrett and is in the process of doing so. This is going to bring tremendous opportunity to us and it should be safety and a feeling of confidence in both the loop and your town. You see Sarge sitting there and he's standing beside Mayor Mandy Sims. Yeah, Rob's just going to turn back to the group and say, yeah, 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 we believe we don't need to be here. Okay, so hospital? Is there a vehicle Maggie. here that can, like, like, a truck or something? There is an old, like, uh, Jeep from the Korean War that um, uh, Sarge has repurposed. Um, it's there, and it is never not you can just turn the ignition you don't there's no key involved with this gee you may steal it if you'd like so guys i'm thinking about taking that and unless you can convince me otherwise that is what we are taking to the hospital because we are not running there yeah well, no we can't go we can't go to the hospital maggie you said maggie can stitch right ben are we going to take him all over town to find out if the people that are here are actually going to not we can't us over? trust we can't trust the hospital I just I'll just go in and get some supplies then. We well, don't have to go. You just go to Rite Aid. Okay, where's the closest one? I don't know. I've never been to Rite Aid. Okay, well, we can't stay here regardless with Mitch in the way that he is. So no, he's fine. Like we still him. need some Should kind I... of mobility via vehicle. Yeah, but let's just let's just go. Let's just do it. Whatever. He's bleeding out. Right. Okay. Let's get him in. <laughs> you still there? You still with us, buddy? Yeah. No, no, I'm just, it's take, take your time. Help, help, help him into the Jeep. Let's go. It's Uncle. You're dead, man. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So you're able to climb into the Jeep, which is Sans top. Yep. And, you know, it's straight out of like the, the MASH set. Um, and again, as soon as you turn it on, Shannon, it's on. Yeah. And it's running. Okay. This will be the second consecutive episode of season two that Shannon has increased her theft from $52 to Grand Theft Auto. Which is, <laughs> yeah. it's, um, it's just one more thing to the list of impossibilities. I wonder why she knew her way around the police station. <laughs> so you're able to, uh, with the noise that's coming inside, no one runs out to intercept you or stop you. Um, where, what's your destination here? The paperback uh, exchange or the I mean she's gonna go hospital. towards the hospital, but if there's like a pharmacy on the way, she'll stop there instead. Uh Main Street has the pharmacy. In fact, I believe you all went in there one time before when uh you had to fix up Rob's finger. Um oh, right. that would be yeah, that would be that's on Main Street. That's at the same proximity as um the paperback exchange. Okay, then she'll it, go it, there. You see both the pharmacy and you see that the paperback exchange are both on the street. Okay. She parks like in an alley behind like one of the dumpsters or something. Okay. Mm -hmm. Two of you go scout and see if Maggie's like a crazy person. I'm going to go get supplies from the pharmacy. Okay. Hey, someone, for the crystal. For the crystal. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'll someone. let you guys deal with that. Uh, and one of you stay with Mitch. Got it. Split him up. You figure it out. And she I mean, goes and goes to the pharmacy I'm, with I'm the $52 gonna... that she stole before. 
you can get whatever you need in the pharmacy. They're not going to stop you. <laughs> yeah, Rob's already on his way to Miss Maggie. He split him up. He separate. She got me good. Ben, uh, ben looks down. You were in a knife fight. Yeah, buddy. It was really a fight. She got, I get stabbed. It's like the end of Commando. Yeah, except I'm dying. It was, uh, it was bad. Oh, she's so I don't think fast. you're dying. She's so fast in a suit. So I hit her in the you're knee. So, did you get in a good shot? I don't know. She kicked me. I fell over. Rob hit her with the bike. It's like a ninja. Seeing Ben, who is unfortunately versed in injury, um, looks over his shoulder at Jerry and kind of raises an eyebrow and says, I'm telling you, this place is great. I, 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 are you? You stay here. And Jerry's going to go storm off after Rob. Time out. <laughs> Rob, you are about 10 feet away from the paperback exchange when you smell 1969. <laughs> what a distinct odor. Yeah. And he's, uh, his eyes are going to get big. Uh, and he's going to maybe kind of pick up the pace until he can kind of get a view through the window or see if anybody's in there. Or When you look inside the paperback exchange... It looks exactly like it does in your garret. There are crystals hanging from line all over the ceiling. Incense is burning in small clouds. Racks and rows of paperback books and stacks and stacks of comic books. And there, in a flowy Stevie Nicks-esque dress, is Miss Maggie. Um... It's has Jerry caught up with him at this point? You can hear Jerry coming, sure. Yeah, he's gonna wait. He's gonna wait for Jerry to get to him because he's not in the chance that she's, you know, Maggie X. You know, the bad bad Maggie. He wants to have somebody there with him who's got substantial size. Sure. Yeah, Jerry, you catch up quickly. George, where are you right now? Are you helping Shannon? Or are you sticking with Mitch? Uh, I think I'm going to be sticking with Mitch. Okay, so Mitch and uh, you're with Ben and uh, uh, you and Ben are together with Mitch. Gotcha. Yep. Shannon's actually buying something and um, Jerry and Rob are in front of the paperback exchange. Everyone's so placed. So far, so good. Purpose. So far, so good. You take the lead. But okay. if things get sketchy, we we leave right away. Agree. Yes, yes, agree. And we're going to walk on in. You open and those combination bell crystal kind of mechanism clinks clink, 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 as you come in and she turns and it's that almost like a, a, a music video where you turn it, it's slow and all of like the, the flowy dress kind of turns. And as she sees you, she says, Rob. And she opens her arms. He's just going to run, run to her. And the, the fact that she recognized who he was, was enough for him. She, Did she mention anything about the cutoff sleeves? She doesn't. Um, but she wraps you in a hug. And she whispers in your ear, let's just share this one. Jerry, you can see this occurring. Uh, Rob's taken no precautions to hide it. Jerry's going to let him have it because, uh, you know, he knows the allure of this place all too well. Maggie pulls back and looks and says, I don't know exactly what's going on. I never do. What do you need from me? Mitch, Mitch is hurt. 
And he, he needs help. You have a Mitch? Uh-huh, uh-huh. And show me. And she rushes towards the door. Yeah. And um, he's, 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 as long as Jerry's following at this point, you know, I'm going to I'll scurry back to the alley with her. Within moments, uh, Mitch, your vision is filled with Miss Maggie as she leans over. Oh, Mitch. Yeah. Hey. Miss Maggie is here. Yeah. I have you. And she turn, she turn, turns to George. I assume you can carry him. Yeah, I got him. She looks around. Do you not have a Shannon? You two. Two. You have two. One bad. I got a bad one. Oh. The other one's just okay. <laughs> <laughs> Our Shannon is actually buying supplies. At this point, Shannon, you'd be coming out with everything that you've noted there. Snacks. <laughs> yeah, you have everything that you could purchase. $52 could basically buy you half the store at that time. Yeah. So um, you're able to come out with whatever you need. And as soon as Maggie sees you, she nods and you see a tear run out of both sides, both eyes. Get him to the paperback quick. Okay. So she's a good Maggie. That's nice. <sighs> you guys see a really shitty backpack. The zipper doesn't actually close all the way where Shannon's put all of the stuff that she just bought. It's like one and of those like ultra rainbow LLB knockoff, just not, not good. Um, Maggie will not only not use what you've brought, but she gives you additional stuff and to put in your backpack. She gives you like bandages and butterfly strips and things like that as she produces what can only be called like a crash trauma kit from beneath the counter. And she locks the door and for the first time in known history, pulls down the dusty blinds along the front window, obscuring the outside world from that of the sancta sanctorum of the paperback exchange. My friends, in Garrett's where the paperback exchange exists, it is considered your hideout. All of your conditions can be healed here with enough time. And my friends, you have enough time. As she works on Mitch sewing up his side, Mitch, you'll still have an injury. Uh, it won't, you won't have the condition, but you'll still have that much like Frags had his broken finger. Um, Morning turns into afternoon as noon comes around somewhere in some other universe as two o'clock rolls around. Lisa from McDonald's stands in a green dress in a center court waiting for a George Butts that will never arrive. And just as you are all patched up, Ben turns to Jerry. Maybe, maybe this is all we need to do. Maybe we can, this is, this is just like our Maggie, man. We can do it here. If they come for us here, we'll, 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 we, can, we can do it. Right? Anybody else hear this exchange between them? Or not? You probably hear whispers. They're, he's not being oh, okay. particularly okay. quiet, right? Friends, we can't stay here. I know you want to. We can't stay here. There are two other guys that belong here. We don't. Maybe they're assholes. If we take this from them, we're the assholes. And that is Jerry logic that Ben can't beat. Damn it. Hey, hey guys, now that we're all like alive, sort of. She takes the newspaper out and puts it down in front of everybody. I'm supposed to be dead. And uh, I may or may not have gotten out of the morgue next to the bodies of 
me and Dutch, who, by the way, had the, the, the teeth thing going on. So. Uh. Oh, and, you know, our friendly chief that we dealt with in the last, you know, our is uh, here too. And uh, I think he has something to do with all that. Maggie hears this part and she looks over at Shannon and then at all of you. Rugen knows wherever you go, assume that he knows. Hey, so now that I'm not immediately dying, um, there's a, there's a bad Shannon, but she's not, she's not Shannon. She's not here, Shannon. She's a Shannon Wait. like us. She's in a suit. She says she killed other Mitches. She says she had to kill one more to save her dad. And then she tried to stab me to death. It's very and quick. That means you're the last one. Yeah. And she's a professional Mitch killing Shannon. Which is something I never thought I'd have to say with my mouth. She almost did it. For her super Rob. The wheels of steel or something. Oh. How did she know where you were? What did you give me? She was waiting for me. She was That's... there. I was in a field. I was in the middle of nowhere in a field. And she said, one more Mitch. And then... It's like, well, obviously that's not a coincidence. How does she know? It's like Halloween. I don't know, man. Well, we need to find out because if we have yeah. to jump again, then... I'm sorry. I was too busy not getting that's... stabbed to death. No, I, I get it. But it's, now it's that you're not dying, we need to figure out what happens next. It's the loop. Yeah. I they, think... they know. They are up to something. When I got here, I was over in Shady Acres. What the fuck? And... My dad was there, but not, you know, not Megatron, like right. my dad should have been. Um, he was gonked. I mean, he was out of his mind. They had him on meds. He was drooling. He was speaking in whispers. Couldn't fixate. He couldn't look at anything straight. And he told me that my mom didn't die in a car crash, that they did it. The loop did it. And as soon as he was talking about it, an orderly busts in and a dude in a suit with a gun tell me to get out so that they can medicate him. And uh, I'm not ready to get shot. I'm not Jerry. I, I don't know if I could take it or shoot somebody. I don't know, but. Uh, so we need to break your dad out of hospital jail. Potentially, but he, I don't know what we can do to save him. I think maybe, but also I, we got to look at the loop. So we got to find a way we're, we're reacting. We got to, we got to figure out what's going on with the loop so that we don't react anymore. We can start making educated moves. I agree. So we got to break into the loop as well. We're Mag here to Maggie fix what, what, what they broke. We gotta Maggie moves it. forward and she takes the paper that Shannon had and opens it like two or three pages in and kind of displays a map of Garrett. And you can see a ring that is extending far beyond the original ring of the loop. And this ring is cutting directly through Garrett and the surrounding fields. They're expanding. They're doing something. They've bought up farms and property in town. The local government says it's fine that they're building some type of missile defense in the event of a war with the Soviets, which I believe is going to happen any time. It's inevitable. Things have gotten very bad. They don't believe uh, in peace. I I, I heard, heard at the, the town town meeting that they have bunkers uh, against against that. the The president has built a bunker. We only have the the ones from the fifties. Unless the loop has something, some ace up their sleeve. Which they probably do. I don't know. It was all very confusing and hard to understand. Um, Maggie? But... Yes, Is dear. my dad around? Her face falls. I'm... <clears throat> Sh 
Sean fell several years ago. How? I don't know. Well, what, well, what about my mom then? This isn't your mother. No, I get that. But what happened? Your Aaron is troubled. The Shannon here was not good. Yeah, there's a lot of that going around, apparently. She kind of cuts across the space to you, Shannon. And this is not condescending. Maggie never really is. She talks to all of you both as a like a mother figure, but also as a friend, as an advisor, but also as somebody that's learning from you all. And it's with that voice and that manner that she speaks to Shannon. They are not you. As difficult it is, is to separate, they aren't you. Yeah, I, I understand that. Obviously, I'm not whatever they did, and I could have easily been who they are, and I guess vice versa. I, I have no attachments to whatever is happening here other than the fact that we're here to figure something out, and it's supposed to help us save everything else. That's all I can hope for, I guess. She nods. I don't know. Everything you said is right, except for one thing. What? You said it would be easy for them to be you. That's not true. They chose what was easiest for them. They chose the circumstances that had given them their lives. You chose the more difficult path. If it were easy, Everyone would do it. Fair enough. So, I guess, what's our next move? Do we go to the loop? I can help you all if you would like to try to get into the loop. Rob's nose begins to bleed. We can, and she kind of goes over and points to the facility. They have tours that go through the loop and we can get you all in there to see exactly what it is they're up to. All of your ears pop. Yes. Maggie, you have crystals? Leave some yes. behind. You have special what? crystals? Are they special? No. Rob, leave some behind now. Yeah, and he's, he's, as he's fumbling through that, he's also gonna pull out a wad of napkins and start handing out napkins as he's also <laughs> dumping a crystal. <clears throat> Do you need crystals? Do you? And she sees the velvet bag that, that Rob has that he's kind of pulling one out and you dump it to the ground. What should I do with this? The others have never had any. Bring it as far away from here as you can. Okay. No, no, no water. Yeah, not in the water though. Okay, all right. Um, come here, children. And she opens her arms up to kind of gather you in. Do you all do something like that? She's trying to hug us? Yeah, Rob does. Yeah. Rob's, yeah, no, Rob's a hug. Did she just stitch me up? I'll give her a hug. She's Yuri's kind of pulling you into a group into it. Yeah. And then little, yeah. yeah. We know they're magical hugs, so yeah. you know, who's going to deny a magic? Bring it in, guys. Yeah. Bring it in. You, you push Ben in, and Ben, was, ben goes with the push. I was going to go anyway. And <laughs> he immediately starts hugging just to make you know that you're not making him do something he doesn't want to do. Um, so you're all gathered in a hug and I need a, a comprehend role from Mitch. Great. Uh, let me see here. Foof. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to spend a luck point there, uh, Greg. Sure. Sure. That sounds good. One success. It's rougher this time. It's maybe your injury, your exhaustion, even though you don't have the conditions, you still are experiencing those things as you begin to move away from this garret. You 
have what information you've gleaned, what knowledge has been secured from this Garrett, Garrett Beta, as you are being pulled away. This is the same Garrett where Pat and Sean, Pat um, Mitchell and Sean Locke arrived for the very first jump. This was when Sean and his recordings to mother and daughter said that Pat saw his wife and it upset him. It didn't upset him because she was in a bad way. It upset Pat because he saw exactly what Mandy would become without him. And that was mayor of the city. As you begin to pull away, you can feel Maggie holding you and she's singing and humming to you as you begin to sink into the floor and you can tell that it's some type of song from the 60s. Um, Rob might be the only one to realize that it's uh, Crosby, Stills, and Nash as you sink into the floor. Everybody, please roll me your best skill as you are in the place between. Everybody, if you would, go to your Spotify playlists. And let's go back to Take On Me. Is that everybody, Jerry? There we go. <clears throat> as you are all careening through the rows, as you see those star fields whip by, Mitch, you had gathered a little segment in your mind the last time this happened, but you only can really focus on that segment again. You, you, you can't look at anything new. You don't glean any additional information from what's going on. And you are all, this time, Jerry, as Ben's holding on to you, you feel him pulled from you. And as you spin and float and twist, Jerry, you are standing along a dirt road in a house that had been resplendent and the best you'd ever seen it with a yard that was manicured and a fridge that didn't have any beer, now stands as a skeletal frame consumed by fire. As you turn, you see a man walking a dog. The man looks vaguely familiar. An old faded sign says property of Garrett United Bank. A small shrine has been erected at the very end of the driveway. Pictures of Jerry from the age of 12 and earlier. There's a football, deflated, weathered. Everything seems weathered, not maintained. A smeared card that is still legible reads, I'll never forget you, your best friend, Ben and predominantly displayed around a wreath of dead flowers. It says, rest in peace, Jerron Jerry Baker, 11-14-1974 to 11-14-1986. George, you are in your bedroom at your house and the door bursts open. Your father, Eugene Butts, wearing a sombrero comes in Hey, kiddo, happy Cinco de Mayo. We have reservations tonight at Hot Tamales. Your dad, healthy, vibrant, as goofy as before. You need a ride to school, champ? <clears throat> Only if you haven't lost your marbles. Huh? No, of course not. Still got them all right where I put them. If you say so. Looking at the sombrero hat. Anywho, if you need a ride, let Amy know. And he leaves the room. Amy. You have never, you don't know an Amy, especially not one that would give you a ride to school. Shannon, roll move. A failure gets you a condition. A forearm takes you just below the throat and knocks you down on your back. A face fills your vision. It is your father, Sean Locke, 
looking as young as you know him and your Garrett, but his hair is cut high and tight in a military fashion. You can't get distracted. One mistake and you are dead. Do you hear me? Get up. Roll, uh, investigate as you stand, if you do stand. Two successes. Your father is more muscled than you remember. And your father was always not heavily muscled. He's heavily muscled, like a weightlifter from the 80s now. He is big, broad, thick as a barrel across his chest. chest. And when you look in your basement of your house, in the corner, you see a man with a clipboard and a stopwatch, shadowy. You can't recognize any features. Your father turns, indicates to the man in the corner and just says, again, and he gets down into a stance and brings his arms up. You can see that your father, who looks like you remember him, but more muscled, is moving with severe purpose, as severe as that haircut that he has. He's not pulling any punches. He is attacking you full force, this time within a roundhouse aimed at your head. Remind me to have you roll move next time. Okay. Mitch. Yes. You're underwater. You are strapped into the back seat of a car. You can't breathe. What would you like to do? Is there anyone else in the car? I'll give you this one for free. There appears to be a half decomposed corpse behind the steering wheel. Is the car full of water? Um, let me check my notes. Fuck yes. Cool, 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 cool. Uh, yeah, I'd like to get out of the car, uh, uh, Greg. That's what I'd like to do. Uh, <laughs> uh, sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, to get out of the rusted safety harness and the door, roll me a tinker. Okay. Okay. Uh, do I have my trusty um, wrench on me? Yes, you do. You have, you have everything that you had with you before, and I'll let you know, too, that a failure results in a condition. Of course it would. Three successes. You are able to get yourself out of the safety harness, and you are able to burst the window, even with the pressure. It appears to have sustained damage and was just about ready to give anyway. Um, and with the fact that there's already water in the car, there's not that same type of pressure differential that there would be. So you're able to poof, kind of break it and pull yourself through. You see that it's about 30 feet to the surface. Yeah, he's kicking and flailing and doing everything he can to get there. And with that extra success, I'm going to go ahead and let you get to the top of the Castleman River. As you look back, you see your mom's old sedan floating at the bottom, not floating, at the very bottom of the Castleman River. You are in a wooded section off of rural Route 36, about four mi miles outside of where the trade winds should be. You pull yourself to the gravel beach. Mitch, welcome to Garrett. Rob, you are standing outside the main display window of McCrory's department store. People crowd along Main Street, but you are fixated on the product being advertised in the main window. There, displayed with banner and with sign, it says, Amy and Aaron, the helping hands your family needs. Meals, childcare, shopping, any and everything to help make your life yours. Behind the glass, two seemingly human figures wave, incredibly lifelike. The woman, presumably Amy, looks directly at you and winks. As you spin around taking the rest of Garrett's main street into view, you see a dozen Amys and a half dozen Aarons, walking dogs, carrying grocery bags, or any of an other number of domestic chores. You are not used to seeing these two do anything. In fact, you are used to seeing them just sitting on a couch. For you see, 
the Amy and Aaron behind the glass and all their copies walking along the streets are the spitting image of your parents. And that's where we will end our session of Atari Twilight. Stay tuned for next week and episode three, Game Boy of Atari Twilight Rollout. Jesus. Oh my gosh. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, uh, that happened. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, let's go around, do our introductions, get the hell out of here so we can do the after show for this show. Uh, if you guys want access to the after show uh, and you want to just support the channel uh, as a whole, Patreon link down below. Join us at the $5 tier for that. While you're down there, join us over in the Discord, be a part of the community, be a part of the conversation. But for now, let's go around, do our introductions. Uh, we'll start with uh, we'll start with, uh, with with Meta. Who are you? Where can we find you? What are you up to? Hello, I'm Meta. This is where you can find me. I'm not doing anything else. Perfect. I love how quick the outros are for this show. Uh, Mike, <laughs> uh, same questions. Uh, same answer. You can find me here. You can find me on Discord. Uh, and if you do the uh, Burning Crusade Classic thing, hit me up on Discord. Okay, okay. Only if you're Alliance. We don't do Horde. Don't or, worry. Or New World. Um, Bitters, uh, who are you working find you? What are you up to? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm basically the same as the rest of these guys. I'm Mr. Bitters. You can find me here. Uh, this is about all I do on the internet. And uh, you know, come back next week. Perfect. Frags, same questions. Uh, you can find me in the streets. You can find me in the club. You can find me posted up on the corner. No, I don't do anything. Uh, <laughs> yeah, if you like me, catch me here. Or just DM me on Discord or Twitter, whatever. All right. And last but definitely not least, Greg, who are you? Where can we find you? What are you up to? Hi, I'm Greg Grimjack21502. I'm not on the internet, but you can find me on the Discord of Unmade Gaming. Go into the Atari Twilight Writers Room uh, at me, and we can talk. Um, otherwise, I'm just here having fun with uh, some great people on a great channel and a great community. Hell, Mike. Freaking, yes, yes. Um, yeah, I'm here. You can find me here. Uh, that's it. Uh, we're out of here. We're gonna do after show. Check it out. It'll be up tomorrow uh, or maybe tonight on on uh, on the, uh, the the Patreon. Uh, so for now, we'll see you guys uh, next week. So from all of us to you, bye-bye. <laughs>